Are we starting? No, well, we are soon. Uh, I'm okay. all set. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, are we going to start uh, right now or, or in a few minutes? When I went on this morning, that we still have next week's listed as an option. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask an Addiction Specialist. I'm Bob Weathers, and I'm happy to be with you again this week. <clears throat> I want to thank my co-producers, Franz Salvatierra and Austin Armstrong. We're here in the offices here in, in Irvine, and uh, very grateful to their technical expertise as well as moral support. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, this is our 14th or 15th podcast in a series, and I want to direct you to our previous uh, uh, podcasts in an archive that's available through Facebook or Beginnings Treatment and or YouTube. So we have all of those resources available to you, and I encourage you to access those as well as there are links provided to the PowerPoint slides that I use for each of the presentations. And so if these uh, might be of service to you, I encourage you to, to go back and check those out. We've covered a range of topics. Topics. Last week we, we talked about, um, felt like it was appropriate in the context of the holidays, we talked about how to say we're sorry. <clears throat> um, to put it in the context of addiction and recovery, particularly in terms of the 12-step language, we talked about how to make amends effectively. So we went into that in some detail last week. And again, I encourage you to check out last week's uh, podcast as it's archived on those previous sites. Uh, today we're going to be uh, uh, moving in a different direction, and I think before I announce the topic, I want to tell you a story, and the the topic will will uh, be generated from the story. Uh, as fate would have it, life is this way, isn't it? I had a conversation this morning with a friend of mine uh, that was so pertinent to today's topic, which I had already prepared for that I felt like it'd be best to kick off the story because I think sometimes stories locate us in experience more uh, intimately than do abstract titles. So what my friend shared with me is a recent experience in which he was <clears throat> uh, boarding a, 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 an airline flight and as he sat down uh, realized that he uh, had the beginnings of symptoms of pretty severe heartburn. <clears throat> now those symptoms stayed with him through this flight and owing to the limitations of space and uh, access to medications, he had to find some way to relate to this heartburn. <clears throat> and so what he described to me this morning, as in a previous conversation, is that it just went into the sensations. He realized that to fight them was to be in misery. And I guess one important part of the story is that he's committed to uh, abstinence in his own recovery uh, uh, from alcoholism right now. And uh, in that commitment to abstinence, what he would typically have done would have been to medicate the heartburn with, uh, with alcohol. And he chose not to do that. Then left without that particular recourse, what was he to do? So he stayed with the sensations, which were highly unpleasant, of the, of, of the heartburn. And in that began to, to open into 
how the sensations uh, ebbed and flowed. They weren't uniformly intense. And how that actually being with the sensations in this more mindful uh, way afforded him some uh, consolation amidst the symptoms. It wasn't a magic bullet, but it was a different posture to take towards acute discomfort. Now, as he and I spoke, he shared with me a further realization that followed on this experience uh, on the airline flight with the heartburn. And that was he began to query, I wonder if this might apply to other arenas of my life. For example, besides uh, physical sensations and discomfort, as with heartburn, I wonder how this might apply to emotional unpleasantness when feelings of anger or sadness other feelings arise. Might there be a way for me just to be with them, be present with them, and follow them uh, with my attention, not trying to squelch or fix or deny them, but just be with them in this more conscious, mindful kind of way? And might that make a difference? In fact, the, the, uh, the aha experience that arose for my friend here was that simply being with, being present with, whether it's physical sensation or emotional feeling or thoughts that might arise, being with those in this kind of radical presence, what came to him is that his, that his contentment, his peace of mind, really might not be quite so contingent as he previously thought on whether he had good feelings in his chest, that is, regarding the, the heartburn, or good feelings in his heart related to feelings, emotions that arise that, that themselves kind of come and go. And it was this awareness that there might be a way to be with his experience that doesn't depend on only having happy feelings to be basically at peace, to be basically contented. Now, his sharing this story again with me today, especially attended by his insights, sets the tone for where I'd like to go today in our conversation, and it plots us right in the midst of something that's very significant, I believe, uh, uh, as we look at establishing the foundations for a sustained, successful recovery from addiction. Specifically, we'll be talking today about practicing self-observation. I'll be fleshing this out today, both with research and theory, as well as an exercise. We'll be actually be doing an exercise in which we'll be applying insight meditation. So today's topic, practicing self-observation, insight meditation as it's applied. As a special bonus today, at the very tail end of our conversation, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about New Year's resolutions that matter. And so that'll be the postscript for today. So hang on for that as well. As we embark today, I want to invite all of you to please feel free to submit questions that come up for you uh, that may already have come up for you, but that, that might come up for you over the course of the next hour together. And I want you to submit those. You can submit those online through our Facebook group. Uh, submit those directly to uh, Austin, and Austin Armstrong, one of the co-producers, will feel those questions and he'll uh, bring those to my attention as we go along, and I'll do my best to respond to those. And so <clears throat> I'll uh, periodically punctuate our conversation by checking in to see if there are any questions. I'm quite sincere in inviting them. I would like very much to interact with you as we go along. Okay, so to today's topic. Practicing Self-Observation. <clears throat> 35 years ago, I completed my doctoral dissertation in, in a clinical psychology on the topic of mindfulness. Um, this was in the early days of research into meditation and specifically mindfulness. There wasn't a lot out at that point. Um, I'll tell you what got me into this topic to begin with. I started graduate school in, in the fall of 1979. And uh, there was a local YMCA in Pasadena, California, which is where I went to school. And I went to uh, the YMCA most every morning and uh, would get there very early in the morning before, the, before my uh, school or my work day began. And I would swim. It was the first time that I had swum laps uh, 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 regularly. And I uh, did this every morning. I would swim for a good half hour to 45 minutes in the, in the pool. They're just swimming back and forth. 
And I discovered something in my swimming, which is that as I got into a rhythm, there was very much a sense of, of uh, being in a zone. I think this is before the term being in the zone came out. It later got picked up and was referred to as being in flow. But uh, I experienced uh, these experiences uh, without any terminology. They were, uh, and what I was taken by was it was as if at some point uh, I wasn't so much swimming as being swum. I don't know if that makes much sense unless you have a reference in your own experience. I later experienced the same phenomenon when I began running regularly. I would run several miles. Uh, later on, I began running several miles, several miles a morning. And uh, I had the same experience there where at some point it would transition over to where I didn't feel like I was so much running as if I was being run. And there was a sense of the kind of the running going through me. I've also experienced this powerfully since a young, uh, young age um, uh, as a musician. Uh, I've played drums since I was nine years old, and, uh, um, which is coming up on 53 years. And uh, I've experienced this uh, uh, a lot over the years, even at, at a young age, where I'd be drumming, practicing drumming, and after, uh, after uh, 20 minutes or so of drumming, it just begins to flow. In fact, now, uh, I, in fact, I just played this last weekend for Christmas Eve at a local club. When I'm drumming, I'm not concentrating on what I'm playing. I'm really concentrating on what's going on around me musically, and the drumming just kind of flows out of my drumsticks, so to speak. So this experience of swimming, running, drumming, um, uh, prefigured my later interest in meditation. So it started with the swimming in the pool there at the YMCA in Pasadena. And then sometime in the first year or two of graduate school, I volunteered for an experiment where, where an upperclassman was doing an experiment with biofeedback. And so I volunteered for this. I tended to like to volunteer for these things because I was uh, interested in learning in whatever form or fashion. And this was a way of just experiencing uh, something new. And so he would hook me up each week to uh, galvanic skin response. It was a sensor that would go on my fingers and would uh, it measures the sweat, believe it or not, in your skin, which is, a, is tied very sensitively to your stress level. It's amazing to me still how uh, a measure like this can, can uh, uh, gauge uh, uh, rising, rising and falling in terms of your uh, stress level from one moment to the next. So I volunteered for this experiment and, and I engaged in it for a semester. One time a week, as I recall, I would go in and we would just practice this. The biofeedback part was that as my stress level rose, it would uh, measure on, uh, on a, there was an oscilloscope, so it would measure in terms of a wave rising. But I, what I'm more struck by is there was also a tone associated with it. So it would go higher in pitch. With stress and it would drop ooh, it would drop with my uh, relaxing and so quickly enough you learn how to be able to control something that only ever felt beyond conscious control that is uh, uh, your kind of moment-to-moment -moment stress level so uh, this was a second experience along with the swimming the biofeedback that set me up I think this was in the first year of graduate school because by that summer of 1980 the following uh, the summer after my first year of graduate school was a summer of a lot of changes for me, not the least of which is that I became very interested in uh, and began reading for the first time ever, reading in the various meditative traditions. Uh, for me, primarily, they were from the East, associated with, with uh, uh, Buddhist practice and Hindu practice in terms of various meditations and yogas. I remember uh, going with my wife at the time, Tammy. Uh, we volunteered for... Uh, uh, a course at the local library, Pasadena City Library, where I was introduced to yoga and breathing for the first time. And this was be my first exposure to any form of meditation. And I began reading a lot of books on Zen. And somewhere in that summer, I uh, realized that reading yet another book or an article on meditation wasn't really going to achieve what it was I was reading about. So I set down the books. And I remember uh, in my apartment there in Pasadena, crossing my legs, scooting up next to a wall. I had a little stucco design on it. I could still re remember it. And uh, following the instructions that I had learned about meditation. And that was my first entry on my own into silent meditation. 
And uh, the instructions I were following were very closely related to what we're going to do today. And so this is the beginning of my practice of mindfulness meditation in 1980. And uh, my introduction to this practice of self-observation. And uh, uh, the meditation uh, that I followed uh, it, it was uh, sometimes called mindfulness, also referred to as insight meditation. And I had read a number of books on on insight. One of the key books for me was a book by Joseph Goldstein, simply called The Experience of Insight. It was a very appealing introduction to me to something that I certainly had never been exposed to before. And what he and others uh, in the field of mindfulness meditation described um, was that meditation involves learning, training ourselves to become present in, in, the, in, in, in the moment, to become aware of the present moment, and to do so by simply noticing thoughts and feelings as they arise and as they pass, <clears throat> coming and going. And uh, it sounds pretty simple. It sounded pretty simple to me. And, uh, and I remember that first experience still of meditating all those years ago is that I sat and I looked at the, at the wall, the white wall with a little bit of texture in it, looked at the white wall for uh, about 20 minutes or so, and at the end of that initial meditation session by myself, I remember uh, thinking, first of all, first of all, that this, uh, one of our <laughs> the gentlemen I just told the story about just says, hello, Dr. Bob. Hello to you, Michael. It's great to have you here, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> well, Michael and others, what I experienced after that first meditation session was, was not fireworks. Uh, it, but it was my first experience of, of just stopping and seeing if I could just notice what was crossing the field of my awareness without distraction. I'd never done that before. And even though there weren't fireworks, uh, what, what, what got stimulated for me was curiosity. And I realized I wanted to come back to this. And I did come back to it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And so here we are, is it 37 years later or close to, or a little bit more than that, 37 years later, uh, I've been practicing that same practice or some variations on it, but pretty close to that practice, uh, more on than off through all of these years. I've had some periods, some seasons where I did less meditation, uh, but I've continued to be very interested in all of these years. It was all of this that led to my doing my doctoral dissertation research on mindfulness. I was quite fascinated by it. And just to kind of move forward then across the decades, it was in the last 10 years that I uh, uh, began to be aware that there, that there were some new figures, some new thoughts in, in mindfulness meditation that got my interest. And it started by my going to a conference about 10 years ago and hearing uh, Dr. Dan Siegel present at this conference. And uh, among other things, uh, Dan talked about how it is that, that with the advent of brain scan technology, for example, the ability to do functional MRIs, to see what's going on in the brain uh, as it changes, including in meditation, he cited research that suggested that there's actually, with a little bit of practice of this, of this mindfulness, that there's actually a thickening in the frontal cortex that's uh, detectable and statistically significant for those who practice mindfulness versus those who don't, the control group. Uh, I got interested in this to think that that's amazing that, that mindfulness is actually changing the brain and it's now detectable with the advent of, of this brain scan technology. Uh, with good fortune, I came in contact with another figure in my life, and this was uh, Dr. Bonnie Badenoch. Bonnie became my supervisor and was my supervisor for several years. She herself was a student of Dan Siegel's. Dan Siegel was, was uh, one of the seminal figures in the establishment of what's come to be called interpersonal neurobiology, which is studying what happens in the brain as a function of our, uh, of our relationships, particularly our relationships with loved ones. And I was very interested in this topic as a therapist. And Bonnie's expertise 
was and is, has continued to be in interpersonal neurobiology as well. And so uh, I met her at the time that she published her first book. Her third book has just been published here recently. Her first book, Being a Brainwise Therapist, was my introduction to Bonnie's writings. In fact, the foreword to this book was written by Dan Siegel. She studied under Dan Siegel and has uh, had a direct positive impact of translating his work to me in a very personal way in terms of our supervision and our friendship. Bonnie liked to talk about what goes on. Uh, she herself is a dedicated practitioner of mindfulness, just as uh, Dan Siegel is. Bonnie liked to talk about what happens in the brain in terms of the frontal cortex sending soothing GABA releasing fibers to the, the emotional center of the brain. GABA being a, uh, uh, an an, an, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. That's hard for me to say in, insofar as it inhibits uh, uh, anxiety, that it, it, it's soothing and calming. So Bonnie had different ways of talking about it. She actually talked about the mechanism of meditation and that that it that it's coupled with, with uh, our, that it's linked or correlated with what happens in our, in our most important relationships, our most loving relationships, we experience a similar soothing. And so that there's a parallel between what happens in loving relationships and what happens in meditation. In fact, Bonnie helped me, and I've mentioned this before in a previous podcast, Bonnie was the one who helped me, and this has been really vital to me. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, helped me to understand that uh, one of the things I brought to her in our years of supervision was that as I continued to practice mindfulness meditation, there were times that I felt very lonely. I, I had, uh, owing to my own development and life course, had some, uh, uh, certainly had some experiences of emotional abandonment in significant relationships that left me really vulnerable to feelings of, of loneliness. Uh, when I was alone. And Bonnie suggested that why don't I bring into my meditations an interpersonal component, which I did begin then and have continued ever since then. This is 10 years or so ago. Bringing, uh, uh, bringing people into my awareness as I, for example, offer gratitudes. And I've practiced a gratitude uh, portion of my meditations daily that includes uh, expressing thanksgiving for the, the security and the intimacy and the meaning and the validation that I experienced in the most significant relationships in my life. And I've continued that thanks to Bonnie's advice. I've also uh, included, and it's been really significant to me in my own recovery process from addiction, I've included a significant interpersonal component that that uh, is integrated from Buddhist meditation practice focusing on forgiveness. And so I've included a forgiveness component to my meditation, my mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm that uh, very much draws me into direct relationship in my mind's eye or in my heart's eye to people uh, whom I've wronged. And so I've found really that meditation need not be so lonely. And I'm grateful to Bonnie and to Dan for leading the way in terms of bringing in the interpersonal component uh, 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 right hand in hand with, with mindfulness meditation. Uh, a third friendship that developed uh, over recent years has been with my dear friend from Cape Town, South Africa, Guy Duplessis. And uh, this, this photo that I'm showing you is a photo of Ken Wilbur and Guy Duplessis. Uh, as fate would have it, <laughs> life tends to bring these convergences, doesn't it? Is that my early dissertation research 35 years ago put me in contact with the primary theorist um, upon which my dissertation research was based was the, the much earlier work of Ken Wilber, whose theories of transpersonal psychology, including a, a focus on meditative traditions and their value in terms of psychological development, later developed into what's been referred to as integral theory for the last uh, 20 or 25 years. And Ken Wilber is the founder of integral theory. And one of, uh, one of his... Uh, uh, besides myself, another person who he's deeply influenced and had a very positive impact on is my dear friend Guy Duplessis. And in this photograph, Guy is with Ken. Um, I've also had an opportunity to meet Ken on a number of occasions and continue to experience his positive impact, uh, including on my practicing mindfulness. I've been to conferences recently in the last few years uh, focused around Ken's work on, on integrating 
uh, meditation with both Buddhist traditions as well as Christian traditions and have uh, great respect for the work that uh, Ken continues to do. You can look him up. Uh, uh, you can do a Google search for Ken Wilbur and find out the dozens of books he's written and, uh, and pick his most recent one. Uh, that looks at uh, the, the, uh, the, the future of religion, the religion of tomorrow, to look at kind of the cutting edge of where he's going these days in his thinking. Guy Duplessis uh, and I have developed a friendship over the last five years, and uh, it's included my being very influenced by, by uh, Guy's first book, which was on integral recovery. I'll say more about that in a few moments. Uh, also, Guy was involved in one of the early books integrating mindfulness with addiction treatment, and that book is called The Mind-Body Workbook for Addiction. His co-author, the lead author for that was Stanley Block, a psychiatrist out of the Seattle area, guy who's in Cape Town. And they asked for me to write the foreword to that book, and I was happy to do that. This book is a significant book to me, a significant resource, which I continue to share with clients that I work with who are in recovery from addiction, because it practically draws in, from the, on the one hand, mindfulness meditation and its, and its uh, benefits, draws that into cognitive behavioral approaches to um, in fact, mindfulness provides the foundation for doing some cognitive work around, for example, uh, our expectations or our requirements that we place on reality. And I think it's an incredibly important synthesis of kind of Eastern thought and Western thought in, in a single volume. So I highly recommend that. And uh, Guy has just released uh, his third book, uh, which is, is also an integral recovery. And uh, you can look up Guy Duplessis. Uh, online and also find out the resources there. I count uh, Guy and Stanley's work as also significant in terms of my own, uh, my own uh, continuing to deepen in terms of applications of mindfulness into the present. I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the next individual, and that's Noah Levine. Very early in my own uh, reco uh, recovery, my recovery process began around 10 years ago, but it, it was only a little over five years ago that I finally held to a course of, 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 of abstinence that involved bringing mindfulness into my recovery. And very early on, the work of Noah Levine uh, was significant for me because he's steeped in the mindfulness traditions of Buddhism. And I got very involved and continue to be involved in the local uh, uh, chapters of refuge recovery. And so I recommend this is another resource that draws together mindfulness practices. In fact, the latter portion of this book has a number of different variations that allow for you to kind of improvise and find your way in the mindfulness traditions, specifically as applied to recovery from addictions. I mentioned Noah favorably, and I, when I first met Noah, I've trained under Noah in workshops, and his, his uh, colleague George Haas has also been very significant to me, particularly in terms of training and forgiveness uh, practices. Uh, Noah's father, Stephen Levine, was a very significant early influence for me, also in my dissertation work. Stephen was a world-renowned teacher of mindfulness himself, like father, like son, though Noah has had his own path and entry point into meditation. And uh, thankfully for Noah's carrying that torch forward from his father, uh, has drawn it into, into linkage with, with, uh, with recovery from addiction. And because of my own personal process, that has been a very important and happy marriage for me, the linkage of mindfulness practice and, uh, and recovery for sure. So I'm grateful to you, Noah, as well as to your father. I remember going to an early conference back in the early 1980s where Stephen held forth, and I actually presented a paper at that point on Ken Wilber's work, and this was, these were the seeds of my dissertation. Stephen's work was also mentioned favorably in my, in my dissertation. Let me back up for a second. Can we back up to uh, the Mind-Body Workbook on Addiction? I talked about, earlier I talked about Dan Siegel and his influence on, um, uh, on my understanding of how it is that meditation actually changes the brain. And Bonnie Badenoch's um, important teachings to me, including learning about the soothing quality of, of, of mindfulness meditation practice and how it can be drawn into the interpersonal domain. I, I, I meant to mention this, uh, that Guy Duplessis' work with uh, Stanley Block in this Mind-Body Workbook for Addiction, which I highly recommend, by the way. Um, it's really a workbook. You can uh, work through it. It's really uh, an important book, I believe. They make a distinction uh, there between two different uh, brain systems, and I've mentioned this in prior podcasts, 
but the 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 uh, the default mode network where our brain's natural default is is towards kind of uh, swinging from one branch to the next in our brain and our brains are kind of in active mode like this most all the time and it serves a function of kind of keeping us vigilant both inside as well as outside for the sake of survival and that in order to calm this default mode network which is itself closely linked to the fight or flight uh, uh, system in the in the in the center of our brains requires employing the executive uh, uh, mode network, which itself is more associated with the frontal cortex. We already talked about mindfulness building frontal cortex, and that as that frontal cortex builds, it sends soothing fibers to the interior regions of the brain. It actually helps to soothe the default mode network um, by developing the executive mode network, and it turns out that meditation, mindfulness specifically, is instrumental in terms of building, uh, building brain. And then if we move back to talking about Noah Levine and his work with, uh, with within refuge recovery, um, uh, uh, Noah makes it clear in his teaching, uh, part of what's very helpful to me about Noah's background, as with George Haas, that they both have backgrounds in psychology as well as spiritual practice, specifically meditation from a Buddhist perspective. And I love how Noah draws these together, including in his several books. This book, Refuge Recovery, I recommend to you. It's his most recent book. And one of the connections that's made within the mindfulness traditions uh, connected to addiction is that the number one trigger for relapse, for those of us that are in recovery, the number one trigger for relapse is stress. And so what would it be like to build skills that can help reduce my stress? And it turns out that the research literature in mindfulness suggests that it's one of the most effective, direct ways that we can learn how to lower stress uh, 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 not only when we're meditating, but after we meditate, kind of lowering the baseline level. Do you remember how I told you about my early experiences with swimming and biofeedback? Both of those I learned kind of organically, just learned as I did them, is that I found that both of them helped me to regulate my stress level. So, for example, when I was in graduate school and would be studying for eight hours a day for six years, <laughs> it'd be really likely for my brain to get really activated. How was I going to calm my brain down? And one of the ways that I learned to calm my brain down in order to make it possible for me to sleep was applying what I learned in biofeedback, was learning how to calm down my body from within. And it was, it was the precursor to my learning mindfulness meditation. And uh, so, so it is to the, future, uh, to the present, is that whether it's in the work of Dan Siegel or Bonnie Badenoch or Guy Duplessis in the writings of Ken Wilber, in the writings and contributions of Noah Levine and Refuge Recovery, is that all of these individuals are naming mindfulness practice, among other things, among its other benefits, is a way to calm stress, to, to, calm, our, to, to calm our minds. Uh, in a recent uh, presentation here in a podcast, I called it unstressing, to be able to unstress. So let's move towards an exercise of mindfulness. I'm going to summarize again real quickly. Insight practice or mindfulness, which are synonymous, or practicing self-observation, which is what we're going to be doing, involves practicing being aware of the present moment, being able to focus our attention on the present moment, not past, not future, but the present moment, and to do so by noticing, by placing our attention on thoughts and feelings and sensations as they come and go through the field of awareness. So I'm going to invite you to join me for the next five minutes of mindfulness practice, uh, after which we'll unpack it a bit, including answering any questions that come up for you, and I'll make sure to open up a space and a time for you to send in questions, and I'll respond to them as best I can. But will you join me now for just a few minutes of mindful, uh, mindfulness practice or insight practice? I'm going to start with a mindfulness of breathing exercise for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll move into a few minutes of insight practice uh, per se, okay? I'm going to close my eyes. I encourage you to do the same just to reduce distraction. And uh, get yourself comfortable. If you're sitting or lying down, get yourself comfortable. Take in a deep breath. Hold that breath and then release it. Take in another breath. Feel it all the way down into your belly area. 
hold it, release it. On the next breath, as you take it in, see if you can focus on the rising of your abdomen, the rising of your belly, and then the following when you, the falling of it when you release it. Breathing in, deep breath, and breathing out. Now we're beginning to focus attention. Let's focus one more time on the rising of the tummy, the belly, and the relaxing, the falling. Okay. Now for the next few minutes, we're just going to focus on that sensation of the rising and falling of your belly with the breathing. That'll be the foundation. And as you focus on that, you'll also notice that thoughts arise. They rise naturally of themselves. Certain feelings will come up for you, possibly. Certain sensations. Right now, the left side of my nostril itches. I'm going to choose to scratch it right now. There's a time and a place for not doing that and just observing that, too. As you breathe in and breathe out for the next few minutes, I'll continue to guide you, but I want you to notice thoughts and feelings as they arise. And for now, just label them. I do it by just saying thinking, thinking, and then let the thought go, which is to say, don't follow it. There's a place for daydreaming, but that's not what we're doing here. We're actually setting that thought or feeling on a shelf after labeling it, and then gently bringing our attention back to the breath. So breathing in, breathing out, Noticing a thought or a feeling or a sensation that arises, name it, label it, let it go, and then back to the breathing. Let's try that together. Breathing in. Breathing out. Anything that arises, just gently label it. Sensing, sensing, feeling, thinking. Set it on an imaginary shelf or let it go of its own accord and then gently draw your attention back to your breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. As a thought arises, just label it, thinking, thinking, and then let it go its own way, bringing your attention back to your breath. As you continue to breathe, make note of any sensations if, as with my friend, heartburn is what you notice, just notice that. You can label it sensing or breathing, a burning, however you want to label it. Burning, burning. Notice what it feels like. And bring your attention back to the breath. Some thoughts, some sensations, some feelings clamor for attention. Just observe them. But don't follow them. If a thought comes up, don't follow the thought. Just name it, label it, step back. We're practicing self-observation here. Just observing, witnessing the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations, and then letting them go. A couple more minutes. Breathing in, breathing out. Mm. 
mindfully observing whatever arises in the field of awareness. Lightly or gently labeling it. Noticing it, then setting it gently aside, drawing our attention back to the breath. Watching the thoughts come and go. The same with our feelings. Notice how they ebb and flow, that they're not necessarily static or stationary. And just let them go. Okay, one final deep in-breath. And out-breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back to join us. Any fireworks? I think it's possible. I think my friend Michael, I don't know that he would say it was fireworks, but there were some aha uh, moments following on his experience of just being with, being simply present with his heartburn. And you may have experienced that yourself. I noticed this myself with certain chronic aches and pains. If I can just learn to be with them, sometimes that's all I can do. And just be with them and notice how they are not as solid as I might otherwise have thought them to be. And the same for any feeling state. I think what we're talking about is training acceptance of being with that doesn't need to fix or fade or diminish or deny whatever's going on inside. Just to be with it. Uh, let me ask you to ask yourself, what did you notice? <clears throat> what did you notice in this exercise? I'll tell you what I found uh, in my uh, doctoral dissertation research. I interviewed uh, individuals that were ranging all the way from novices who had just a few uh, hours of experience with meditation under their belt to uh, long-term devotees of meditation that had hundreds or even thousands of hours of meditation. And I interviewed them across this range to get a sense of their uh, varying experiences. And it was so palpable uh, uh, in, in the interviews that the experiences do change over the course of time. Early on, one characteristic, and you may have experienced this yourself, depending on how much experience you've had with meditation, and also just what this day holds for you. Uh, you may have experienced, I referred to it earlier, as the brain swinging from one branch to the next. Uh, in the Eastern traditions, they refer to this as monkey mind. You can get the visual there, the monkey swinging from one branch to the next. And sometimes it's almost impossible to experience anything when we open up this space other than monkey mind. And for some individuals, this can actually be disconcerting or even anxiety-provoking. What might be calming to one individual can actually be overstimulating to another to actually kind of reduce all the background noise and notice how much interior activity there is can be, uh, can be distressful. So you may have experienced some of that activity. You may or may not have, have experienced that as is uh, anxiety provoking, but you may have experienced that kind of activity. And it's very telling just to kind of calm down to realize how flippant active our brains are. This ties into the earlier conversation out of Stan, Blo uh, Stan, uh, uh, Stan Block's and uh, Guy Duplessis' work on the default mode network and how that that's really where most of us operate most all of the time. Now, what would it be like, and some of you may have actually had a taste of this in, this in your experience here today, what would it be like to take those monkeys swinging from branch to branch and begin to kind of increase the space between 
they're swinging from one branch to the next. Here's a better image. I think I got this from Noah Levine in one of his workshops. Is if you imagine a series of uh, train cars going by rapidly, railroad train cars going by, if you can imagine it, when they're going fast, it just looks like a solid uh, slab of iron. But as they slow down, you begin to notice the space between the individual cars. And as they get really slow, that space is actually quite sizable. So it moves from being one solid blur to being discrete packets of railroad cars. And that's not a bad image for what can happen with practice with mindfulness, is that, is that it stops being just this kind of incessant monkey mind or blur of railroad cars, and you begin to experience the space. And with practice, you can actually increase the experience of the gaps between those thoughts. Another image that comes up in the meditative traditions is looking at the, the mind as the open sky and that thoughts and feelings and sensations represent clouds in that sky. But, you know, you can look at them and they look pretty doggone solid and stationary. But given some attentiveness, you can notice that they're actually moving and changing shape and in some cases evaporating. And that's a bit like this mindfulness practice of developing a relationship to the sky of mind. So you probably experience something along that continuum from the one extreme of monkey mind to the other extreme of, 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 of some serious quiet. And uh, the goal of mindfulness isn't, the goal of mindfulness in some ways is goallessness. It's not to set goals, it's just to be with whatever comes up. So no matter what you experience, it's just the being with that and noticing it. And there's value of itself in that. So what is the value? Well, let me go back to talking about Dan Siegel and Bonnie Badenoch's uh, comments. In terms of the benefits of mindfulness, they talk about how it is that we can build brain. And one way to think about that is that, is that we build the executive mode network, the frontal cortex, that we can actually learn the capacity to step back from whatever's going on for us, both in terms of interior thoughts and feelings, as well as interactions that we have. For example, I think this is really important in learning how to manage anger. I work with individuals who are early in recovery from addiction, who are seeking, seeking uh, healing, and many of them, most of them, we talked about this in a group I was in today, are very used to kind of the flashpoint of acting upon anger almost inst instantaneously. Can you imagine slowing down the boxcars of the railroad train to where there could be a gap between the initial thoughts that may be leading towards an angry reaction and the actual flush of anger and the acting that out? And mindfulness practice is one significant tool for beginning to kind of slow down the frames so that we can exercise more choice. Stanley Block and Guy Duplessis talk about this in their mind-body workbook, is that what we're talking about doing is building new muscles of the frontal cortex or the executive system so that we're not run by the default mode network, which operates primarily in this kind of fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so it introduces the possibility of choice. I think it's implied in what we've talked about so far is, is that that a single experience of this, you remember how I told you that first experience in the summer of 1980, crossing my legs and staring at the wall there in my apartment in Pasadena, California. It wasn't, uh, the earth didn't open up, the skies didn't open up, but I was led to be curious and to continue with the practice. It's the, it's the continuation of the practice, day by day, uh, week by week, month by month, that you begin to build new muscles and literally build new brain. And it's with this practice, when I call it practicing self-observation, it's really learning how to step back. Psychology calls it to decenter. To step out of the center of your own experience and reflect back on it requires building the capacity to um, establish objectivity. And this mindfulness or insight practice is one of the clearest, uh, most direct ways I know for building that capacity. I think that psychotherapy or counseling is another one where you're working with somebody to help you to learn how to be more objective about your experience. They work hand in hand. Look at the work of Bonnie Badenoch where she ties in psychotherapy hand in hand with, with mindfulness practice. And so it's the practice that will make a difference for sure. And with that, we're gonna shift in just a moment to talking, talking about some New Year's resolutions 
that might make a difference for you this year. And this that we've just done might be one of them. But before I move into that segue, let me invite any questions that you might have for me. Any questions that you might want to bring to me. Austin? Uh, not yet. All right. All right. Keep I, I invite you to send questions to me. By the way, if something comes to you after this uh, session today, it's interesting. I just I was just leading a group before I came here at, at Beginnings Treatment Centers, and I, I asked the group, I checked in with the group to see if there were any questions. And a couple of individuals said that they were just they were just pondering what we talked about. It was a powerful session that we had. And what I did is I stopped and I acknowledged that each one of us processes at a different pace and in a different style. And if you're like me, you may have a bit of a delayed reaction to even what we've talked about or introduced today in terms of this insight practice. And so I want to invite you, if things percolate up for you over the next few days, you're very welcome to write me at my website. I'll give you that address at the end of, the, at the end of our meeting today. You're also welcome to uh, contribute on the Facebook side of Ask an Addiction Specialist. I believe you can also uh, write comments on the YouTube channel if, you, if that's how you're viewing it. There are multiple ways that you can get back to me with questions, and I will respond to you. So don't feel hurried. If something... Uh, uh, crops up later, bring, continue to, to bring it to me, okay? So let's talk about New Year's resolutions that matter. I can't discuss this without introducing a couple more of my friends, and these are two people that have been really near and dear to me for the last several years. Uh, John Dupuy and Doug Prater. Uh, in the picture that you're looking at there, John John uh, Dupuy is on the far right side, Doug Prater in the middle, and yours truly on the left-hand side. That was from a conference that we were at together earlier this year, uh, earlier this fall in, in Palo Alto. Um, my introduction to, to John uh, uh, began about five years ago as I entered into my own uh, recovery process from addiction. I was very interested in, in finding what, to, what might be, what would be the best holistic model out there that's available for addressing recovery. And because of my own being steeped in the work and the writings of uh, the philosophy of Ken Wilber, I was very interested in an integral theoretical perspective on recovery. And I went to the literature and there was one article that had come out of the University of California at San Francisco. And I looked up, I tried to track down the authors of this article and was unsuccessful in tracking them down. And as good fortune would have it, within a few weeks or months after that, I came in contact with John Dupuy, who was just at that point publishing his first book called Integral Recovery. That's the book that you see right now on the screen. You can look this book up. I highly recommend this to you, particularly if you're interested in a perspective that embraces what we're talking about today, as well as this entire series, an, an integral or holistic perspective on integral recovery. John Dupuy was the first author to go in depth in this, and uh, we've become uh, uh, gloriously close friends. We're both musicians. We love the heck out of each other. And in the last year, we've developed a podcast called the Journey of Integral Recovery Podcast. That's the next slide that you can see there. And that uh, that's on every week. And you can find that uh, 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 on YouTube as well as on Facebook, The Journey of Integral Recovery, that's co-hosted by John, Doug, and myself. And uh, uh, the focus, why I'm mentioning this in the context of, of uh, thank you, uh, in the context of uh, New Year's resolutions, is that what I've learned working closely with John and with Doug is that uh, there's a bit of a misnomer built through this idea of New Year's resolutions. If I only do this once a year, probably I'm in trouble, <laughs> okay, particularly when, it, when we come to talking about recovery. And so really the sensibility involved in integral recovery or holistic recovery is that as important as it is to have a holistic model in mind, it's going to really involve my being involved in daily practice. And I want to talk about uh, daily practice from an integral perspective. We have discussed this actually the very first podcast and several thereafter uh, here with Ask an Addiction Specialist, I laid the foundation for talking about holistic recovery from an integral perspective. I encourage you to review those. I'm also involved on a weekly basis here at a local treatment center uh, in uh, Santa Ana here in Orange County. 
uh, Beginnings Treatment Center itself employs an integral uh, model in our treatment, and so it's very much of a body, mind, spirit approach to to recovery that takes very seriously the practice dimension of, of holistic recovery. I'm going to speak more about that in just a moment, but I want to check and see. It looks like that there's a question that's come in. Let me take a look at this. Uh, this uh, contributor says, uh, thank you, Dr. Weathers. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Heil. I appreciate that. I believe that, that you may be writing us from Japan, and, and I wish you well in Japan right now, Asayo. Very glad to have you online with us. She says, since I started incorporating mindfulness meditation into my life, I can now stop and think why I think or how I'm thinking in a situation without reacting right away. That's beautiful, Masayo. That actually captures, I think, the central benefit of practicing self-observation, or as you say, mindfulness, is that it creates the possibility for us to stop and reflect before we just simply react. It moves us from being just reflexive or reactive beings to being able to be much more conscious uh, or selective in our responses. And I think it's a central virtue of mindfulness practice. I want to encourage, thank you, Masayo, I want to encourage uh, all of us to consider what we might do to bring this practice and other practices into our day-to-day -day lives. And so let me, let me suggest from an integral perspective how it is that we might approach New Year's resolutions with the goal of practicing them, uh, various dimensions of them, on a daily basis. In integral theory, we break down, let's see, oh, that's going to be a little bit confusing to look at. <laughs> we break down we break down resolutions in terms of body, mind, soul. That funny looking word is spirit. It broke up oddly in terms of the PowerPoint, and I apologize for that. Body, mind, soul, spirit, and shadow. Let me say a word about each um, and, and then uh, suggest some practical applications. Uh, in terms of New Year's resolutions, what can I do to honor and strengthen my body in terms of diet, rest, uh, exercise, and for uh, any of us that have struggled with uh, addiction to substances, sobriety uh, is essential, I believe, in terms of setting, setting our intentions for this new year. In terms of mind, I'm really talking about how can we develop mental resources that will serve us. I recommended the book earlier, uh, The Mind-Body Workbook for Addiction, which looks at the cognitive component of our suffering and what we can do about that, coupled with mindfulness practice. I also highly recommend reading stimulating material on as regular a basis as possible. Uh, as my good friend John says, John Dupuis says, is that uh, good reading is psychoactive. It actually is is part of the healing process to take in good solid reading material, especially that which stretches us to take multiple perspectives. Psychology talks about intelligence as the capacity to embrace ever widening perspectives. Why not build in increasing intelligence by stretching yourself beyond your comfort level in terms of what you read on a daily basis? In terms of soul, this is uh, a contribution that I feel like I'm bringing to the, co the conversation in integral recovery. I'm very, very um, dedicated to developing creative resources as, as uh, instrumental to solid recovery. In fact, uh, uh, I'm working on a second book right now. My first book is coming to a conclusion. Uh, it'll be titled Unshaming, Looking at Self-Compassion as Daily Practice. My second book will be looking at unroutining, which is how do we develop creativity as a daily practice? In other words, how do we break up the routines of our lives to stay open to freshness and novelty? And I, I, I personally believe that cultivating your own art form, whatever that happens to be, may be as important for, for uh, creating a foundation for sustained successful recovery as anything. And by art form, I really have a very expansive notion of what that could include. I've already shared with you, one of them for me is, is my drumming. Music for me is a very important part of my, um, of my uh, daily or weekly practice. In fact, tomorrow night I'm going to practice um, with uh, my latest uh, 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 jazz group, and we're working on compositions that are written by the jazz, the, the members of the group, and this is challenging work. I was working on it today over the lunch hour, practicing the, the syncopated rhythms that we're developing really stretch into new areas for me. Even having drummed over half a century, it's constantly pushing the edges of that. So whatever form you have for that, it can be, for some it's athletics, for some others it's art, sculpting, dancing, 
It can be cooking. It can be whatever you do to feed or cultivate, enrich your soul. And then finally, uh, excuse me, not finally, next would be what we've been talking about. I think of spiritual practice being right in the domain of what we've been discussing today in terms of practicing self-observation. How I understand spirit or spiritual development in this way, it's a very non-sectarian approach. And having Wanting to invite as broad-minded an embrace of spirituality as possible. It's whatever it is that, that observes the self in action, I think of as spirit. And if there's a way for me to locate with that, Christians would talk about this in terms of Holy Spirit. Buddhists would talk about this as uh, uh, Buddha mind. Uh, 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 every tradition has some way of talking about this, but it's developing the capacity to step back from ourselves and witness ourselves with compassion. And I believe that there are practices like today's practice that will help serve building spiritual strength as well. And I don't think of spirituality as separate from psychology. I certainly don't think of it as separate from recovery. It's built right into uh, this holistic practice or integral practice that we're talking about. And finally, I have to mention is working on shadow. And what I mean here is a lot of what I've done in terms of my training in clinical psychology, as well as my work over the years as a therapist and now a recovery coach, is helping people to work on those things that uh, are, are out of their uh, immediate awareness, but that are really hamstringing them in terms of forward movement and development in their lives. And so shadow would be simply all that, that I'm not aware of, that I'm actively repressing, that is coming up oftentimes symptomatically. And so it will manifest indirectly in terms of my psychological and even physical symptoms. And what can I do to manage that much more consciously? As my own therapist over the years has said, Bob, you can either deal with things coming in the front gate, which would be to, to work on them consciously, or you can be guaranteed that they'll come in the side gate or the back gate. And so that's really working on the shadow. And there's all kinds of practices for doing that. We've talked about one here in terms of forgiveness practice. I, I, I recommend you to my website where there's a new uh, CD out called the Freedom of Forgiveness. And that Freedom of Forgiveness um, uh, those instructions are very much of going into the shadow. The very things that we want to ignore, including wrongs that we've committed with others, as well as compassion for others, where we might only have judgment. It really, it really like a surgical um, scalpel goes right into shadow material for most all of us. That if not dealt with, manifests in two chief forms: shame and resentment. And so uh, shame and resentment represent part of the core of the shadow. And I believe it's really important that we work with this on a daily basis. And there's all kinds of uh, methods and, and approaches to working with this. I recommend you to John Dupuy's book, Integral Recovery, as well as Guy Duplessis' book, uh, Mind Body Workbook, because they're full of practical exercises and applications for working with shadow, as with my upcoming book on unshaming, which will be a whole book about working with shadow. So if I can invite you to consider this whole range of possible resources that you might invite into your own life in this next year, in 2018, I encourage you to do so. And just as with this meditation today, so with any of these other practices, a single pass won't do nearly enough. How many of us have experienced lifting weights or doing sit-ups or jogging once or twice and only experience pain, but never really experiencing the benefits of it? Whether it's physical exercise or moral exercise or spiritual exercise, uh, uh, in any form, it's, the, it's the, the, the repeated developing building that develops this kind of adaptive spiral of getting stronger and stronger, more and more developed over time. And I encourage you to that in this new year. Uh, uh, I'd like to give you a peek at our next topic. We'll be meeting in two weeks. On January 10th, 2018, which is amazing to imagine. I'll meet you in the new year. We will not be meeting next week. In two weeks, we'll meet and we'll be addressing one other uh, subset within integral recovery within this model is addressing issues of typology. And there's different typologies, but the one that we're all aware of would be looking at masculine versus feminine characteristics. This isn't tied so much into biological gender per se as much as psychological gender or psychological sexual orientation, etc. So we'll be looking at gender in a number of different applications starting in the new year. I plan to do a series addressing gender and recovery, and I'm hoping that you'll find that helpful. I think in this day and age, with the news being what it is, uh, 
uh, in terms of gender collisions and gender liberation and gender assertion that it's really important that we talk about gender in the context of recovery. And I plan to begin to address that in the new year here uh, with Ask Addiction Specialists. And I'm looking forward to, the, to you joining me in that series as well. Let me ask one final time, any questions uh, from our audience today? Any final questions that you have for me? Austin? Not at this time, but... All right, all right. I invite you to uh, send those questions to me, and I'll get back to you. I wish all of you a very happy new year. Thank you for joining me today. Here's my website, drbobweathers.com. You're welcome to go there. I put links to much of this material on my website. In fact, over the next few months, I plan to include links uh, here on my website also for all the PowerPoints, all the videos. Uh, I have lots of activity there on my website involving uh, day, almost daily postings that you're welcome to go to as a resource. It's an informational website. It also has information about this recent CD just produced uh, called Freedom of Forgiveness. I recommend you uh, to that as well. Uh, blessings to all. Happy New Year to you, and I'll see you in the new year. Take care for now.